Is the redaction profile of Mark, if it was the last of the Synoptic Gospels written, really all that improbable? Let's dive in. In our analysis, there are three basic questions we have to answer. First, why would Mark writing third leave out so much material? Second, why would Mark writing third minimize Jesus the way he does? And third, does Mark's more primitive Greek and his Aramaisms make sense if Mark was third? As we'll see, the entirety of the Mark and Priority argument hinges on the answers to these questions. This is because there's no extrinsic support for Mark and Priority, no evidence outside of analyzing the text themselves, none. The evidence from the church fathers, the early historians who wrote about the church starting no later than the second century, all place Matthew ahead of Mark when they discuss order. Every single one. We touched on this briefly in an earlier video and we'll examine that in detail in the next one. So that leaves only the intrinsic record, the evidence that comes from looking within the texts. While intrinsic analyses can be compelling when done properly, even dispositive at times, the track record of synoptic studies shows they're often botched, blundered, and at times agenda-driven. One needs to look no further than the now eviscerated and discredited B.H. Streeter arguments from order we addressed earlier. As a result, today's synoptic scholars are left with two main surviving arguments. The first is the argument from editorial fatigue, which we've shown is not only circular, thus valueless on the issue of priority, but which we'll show is also specious in its claims. We'll address editorial fatigue in greater detail in a later analysis. And the second is the one we'll be addressing here, the alleged improbability of the redaction profile of the author of Mark if that author was writing after Matthew and Luke. So what does this mean for the case for Mark and priority as a whole? Well, it's on life support. To be clear, unless this redaction profile argument survives scrutiny and is so compelling as to dethrone Matthew from its default position as first, a proposition rooted in the extrinsic record and with its own intrinsic support, the justification for the scholarly consensus on Mark and priority is non-existent and Mark and priority, at least logically, is dead. This insight isn't new. The late synoptic scholar William Farmer once lamented, quote, among these difficulties, the only one which appears to be so serious as to block a shift away from the two-source hypothesis, a Mark and Priority theory, in the direction of its major rival, the two-gospel hypothesis, a Matthean Priority theory, is the difficulty in imagining how one can explain the omissions Mark has made from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke on the assumption that the author of Mark has derived his Gospel largely from those two earlier Gospels." End quote. As we go through the arguments put forth by the Markan Prioritists, you'll notice a pastiche of three latent assumptions. The first is that each synoptic gospel writer wrote for the same purpose. Note, I didn't say same genre. It's widely accepted that the gospels share a genre, whatever that genre is called. But not all works in a genre write for the same audience and or purpose, and this distinction is often lost in their analyses. Some novels in a romance genre can be written for teens, while others are for older adults, some target women, others men, some designed for audiobooks, etc. The author's objectives may vary, even though the works fall within the same genre. The second is that later gospel writers would amplify rather than redact narratives. That is, gospels should grow in length and substance, not decrease. And the third is that Christology, the robustness of the image of Christ, should increase from the earliest gospels to the later ones. And there's a bonus assumption as well, one that permeates every argument insidiously. But we'll touch on that one toward the end of the video. But not all scholars take this approach. The late eminent biblical scholar E.P. Sanders argued for a scientific approach to literary criticism, challenging four unfounded assumptions, namely that, quote, one, increasing length, two, increasing detail, three, diminishing semitisms, and four, the, what amounts to two criteria, use of more direct discourse and the conflation of episodes, end quote, has probative value on priority in and of itself. Sanders would also say that, quote, one cannot establish tendencies by citing only examples. What is needed is a thorough investigation of all the evidence, considering how many instances there are which point in each direction. Listing only some instances, all of which point in one direction, is neat, but useless and even misleading. So it's with that spirit that we'll be undertaking our analysis here. And we'll start with Mark's alleged omissions. There are three major ones that the Markan priorities focus on. One, Jesus' birth narratives. Two, the Sermon on the Mount slash Lord's Prayer. And three, the resurrection accounts. 
For these, and for every argument we review, we'll in turn be asking three questions. One, is the argument true? Two, even if it is true, is the argument compelling? And three, are there any alternative explanations for the observations? Even though we haven't touched on it yet, we'll be applying the scientific method here, specifically the two hypothesis approach to testing hypotheses. We start with the null hypothesis, which for now you can consider as the default. Here that would be that there is no good reason to change the original position that Matthew was the first gospel written. This null hypothesis is grounded in the unanimous extrinsic record. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a good reason to change the original position that Matthew was the first gospel written in favor of Mark. This is what we're testing. We'll cover the how and why we use this approach in a separate video. It's also worth keeping the following question in the back of your mind throughout, which is, is there a theory about the purpose the author of Mark may have had that can explain the evidence offered to supplant Matthew? This isn't required per se in the two hypothesis approach, but it is a helpful critical tool. For example, could Mark have simply wanted to write a shorter gospel to be read aloud to a non-Jewish audience? Again, our aim at the moment isn't to provide and test our own theory. Instead, we're using this question to help test whether the hypothesis advanced by the Markan priorities is compelling enough to displace our default. All right, finally, let's get into it. The birth narratives and genealogies of Jesus. As always, our first question will be, is it true? Is it true that Mark omitted the birth narratives and genealogies of Jesus? Yes, technically. Let's dive deeper. What was the purpose of the birth narratives and genealogies? There are two that seem to be unanimously agreed upon. The first is to tie Jesus' lineage to the house of David, fulfilling the Messiah prophecies of the Old Testament. And the second is to establish Jesus as the divine son of God. Skeptical scholar Professor Bart Ehrman sums it up this way, quote, Luke has a different take. He never gives a prophecy fulfillment formula you find so often in Matthew. In his case, the virgin birth has a completely different function. Jesus is born of a virgin because it is the spirit of God that has made Mary pregnant, not a human being, so that in a very literal sense, Jesus is the quote unquote son of God, end quote. Let's take a look at Matthew. We could do this with Luke as well, but Matthew's passage is a bit better for illustration. Matthew 1.1 says, This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He, like Luke, then goes on to give accounts of Mary's virgin birth, demonstrating Jesus as the son not of any man, but of God. Now let's look at the very first verse in Mark, which reads, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. No, Christ isn't Jesus' last name, rather it's the Greek equivalent for the term Messiah, the Savior who was to come from the house of David. So did Mark happen to accomplish all of the goals of Matthew's and Luke's birth narratives and genealogies, Messiah and divine Son of God, in a single sentence? Next we ask, are these omissions compelling? That is, even assuming Mark didn't achieve the same goals, how important were the birth narratives and genealogies at the time? For starters, it's unlikely this was settled tradition at the time of writing. Why? Because Luke and Matthew diverge on a number of details. There are myriad reasons why and the differences can often be harmonized, but this suggests one of three possibilities. One, they had different sources and drew on different harmonizable traditions. Two, one of them made mistakes, or three, both of them made mistakes. Regardless of which it is, it serves as evidence that this was not yet settled tradition. The second is that it's unlikely these traditions, ubiquitous in the church today, were mandatory parts of the teaching at the time of writing. One reason for this is that the Gospel of John, which most scholars agree was the last written, excludes these as well. Yes, John is in a synoptic and it's unclear that the author ever saw the synoptics. Still, if this was such an important tradition in the burgeoning church, it should have made its way into John's Gospel regardless. Note, I'm not arguing that all traditions need to be in all Gospels. But whatever justifications can be made for the omissions from John can also be made for Mark. Professor Mark Goodacre's take on this subject helps reinforce the unsettled nature. He says, Luke is doing his own thing in the birth narrative, and that Luke got the very idea of a birth narrative from seeing it in Matthew, and that it was not that obvious a thing to do. If Professor Goodacre is right, besides suggesting that the gospel writers would just make things up, it reinforces that it wouldn't have been obvious to include these, 
and also that if Luke saw Matthew and still had the divergences, this wasn't settled in a way that would necessitate a later writer including it in their gospel. Finally, we ask, are there alternative explanations that can be given? We talked already about the possibility that gospel writers of the same genre might have different objectives. Perhaps Mark wasn't writing for a Jewish audience and felt that his audience wouldn't know about, care about, or understand the prophecies. Or perhaps Mark felt he couldn't reconcile the differences between the account in Matthew and Luke, and so he removed them. Or again, perhaps Mark simply wanted a shorter gospel. Before we leave this one, there's one more thing. Going back to Mark 1.1, it reads, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I emphasize the words beginning and gospel here. Gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. And Mark starts out by saying he's beginning the good news. It is the only gospel that starts this way. Perhaps Mark simply felt the good news started at the beginning of Jesus' ministry rather than his birth. So let's recap. Mark excludes the birth narratives and genealogies, but wastes no time establishing in the very first verse that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. We know there are differences in the birth and genealogy accounts between Matthew and Luke as well, and we know that John omits these from his later gospel too. Plus, Mark believes the good news begins when Jesus begins his ministry. So all told, does this compel you to a belief that Mark couldn't have come after Matthew and Luke? Seems like a giant meh to me, but you can decide for yourselves. Moving on to the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer. Did Mark really omit these from his gospel? Yes. Technically. Mark did omit these, but this can only be considered relevant if we ignore Luke. Luke omits much of the Sermon on the Mount and he only has a rudimentary Lord's Prayer that misses a number of verses. So again we ask, is this compelling? Even if we assume Luke includes enough to pass the test, how big of a deal is this? Just as with the birth narratives, we have the same issues with the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer in that it's unlikely this was settled tradition at the time. And again, John omits these same things from his later gospel. And what about alternative explanations? Was the author of Mark writing for a different purpose? Again, perhaps he was trying to write for an audience that wouldn't relate to the Jewish themes of the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer. Professor John Dominic Crossan says this about the Lord's Prayer, quote, The Lord's Prayer is utterly totally, fully Jewish. There's nothing in it that's particularly Christian." End quote. Still, perhaps Mark couldn't reconcile the differences between Luke's and Matthew's accounts, or once again, he simply wanted a shorter gospel. Again, let's recap. Mark excludes the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer, but Luke omits large portions of these as well. And once again, we know there are differences between Matthew and Luke's accounts, and again, we know that John omits these from his later gospel too. So are you now compelled to a belief that Mark couldn't have come after Matthew and Luke? To me, it seems like a giant wake me up when it gets interesting, but of course you can draw your own conclusions. Alas, the resurrection accounts. Without question, the resurrection of Jesus is the defining event in the history of Christianity. So did Mark really omit the resurrection accounts from his gospel? No. Technically. The original ending of Mark is contested. We can't get into every detail of that here, but let's start with what's uncontested. Mark's Gospel clearly forecasts the resurrection. In chapter 16, verse 6, it reads in part, He is risen, he is not here. And in the next verse, the angel is telling the women to go ahead and tell the disciples and Peter that the risen Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. But then in verse 8, the Gospel account seems to end abruptly with the women being scared and saying nothing to anyone. What's also uncontested is that the earliest extant documents we have contain a longer ending of Mark, specifically chapter 16 verses 9 through 20. These contain a much fuller account of the post-resurrection appearances. Even though it could be earlier, at the very latest we know that Tatian's Diatessaron contains this longer ending and it dates to sometime between 160 and 175 AD. Likewise, the overwhelming majority of extant New Testament manuscripts contained a longer ending. However, it's also uncontested that the earliest of the extant New Testament manuscripts, which date to the 4th century, some 200 years or so after Tatian, do not contain the longer ending. So is this compelling? No. In fact, it's disingenuous. And it's intellectually dishonest to use this argument as a basis for Mark and priority either way. Generally, there are three possible endings for the Gospel of Mark. A. It's lost or it was unintentionally unfinished. B its inclusion of the longer ending or some variant thereof, 
or C, it's Mark's original intended ending. But since that's unsettled, it cannot be used in an intellectually honest manner at least as an argument either way. Furthermore, even if Mark was first and it ended at 16.8, there's still no clear explanation for why the forecasted resurrection appearances aren't there. And lastly, at the very least, the resurrection is forecasted and Jesus is risen, and so it's not completely omitted. With respect to alternate explanations, as discussed, there's an entire fascinating discussion into the circumstances of this issue in and of itself. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in a deeper dive, but for now, it's beyond our scope. Recapping quickly, Mark's gospel attests to the main fact that Jesus is risen and that he's going ahead to his disciples, and all scholars in the field know that the ending of Mark is a subject of intense debate. It's disappointing that they would argue this in support of their claims, and so I'm calling a cheap shot here with a do better. You can let me know if you disagree. So that wraps up the main arguments used concerning Mark's alleged omissions. Let's turn now to his alleged redactions. Again, here, there are three arguments that are commonly used. The first is Mark has Jesus unable to do deeds of power. The second is that Mark has Jesus seeming to deny he was good and therefore God. And the third is that Mark has Jesus struggle to heal a blind man, needing two steps to complete it. We'll start with deeds of power and we'll ask, is it true that Mark has Jesus unable to do miracles due to lack of faith? Yes, technically. I've taken a screenshot from a YouTube video featuring Professor Ian Mills who uses this argument as a basis for Mark and Priority. I've copied the relevant excerpts below just with a different translation that uses miracles instead of deeds of power. As you can see here, Mark says that Jesus could not do any miracles except, well, a couple miracles where he lays his hands on a few sick people and heals them. And Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. In Matthew, Jesus simply did not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. Yes, one rebuttal is that it's inconsistent with the rest of Mark given his high view of Jesus to have Jesus unable to do miracles, but that's not answering the right question. The question is what would a later writer do seeing either account? Let's go through two scenarios and see which does more to amplify Jesus. Option one, Matthew comes along and sees Mark's version saying Jesus could do no miracles except curing a few sick people. Matthew wants to amplify Jesus, and so he decides to include the same passage in his gospel. He could have chosen to admit it as well, but he elects to change it to did not do many miracles because of their unbelief, while dropping the curing miracles that Jesus had already performed. Option two, Mark comes along and sees Matthew's version saying that Jesus did not do many miracles. Mark wants to amplify Jesus, and so he decides to include the same passage in his gospel. Again, he could have chosen to admit it as well but he elects to change the text to read, could do no miracles except the few miracles, and then changes because of their unbelief to he was amazed at their unbelief. So which does more to amplify? The one having Jesus doing miracles or the other one having Jesus doing miracles? Is it the one where Jesus could not do miracles but still did them anyway, just while being amazed at their unbelief? or the one where a more vindictive Jesus chose not to do miracles because of their unbelief. This genuinely could be argued either way. And as for alternative explanations, the question really is, why is this passage in the text at all? Neither seems to be particularly impressive, so is there another meaning that we might be missing? Concerning deeds of power, if Matthew really wanted to amplify Jesus, he didn't do a great job. He would have been better off dropping this passage altogether, again, unless there's a different reason it's here. Hint, there's a different reason. But that's beyond our scope. I certainly wouldn't jettison 1700 years of subtle tradition over this. For deeds of power, I gotta say it's, uh, I'm not impressed. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Turning to our next redaction, there's only one who was good and therefore God. Does Mark really have Jesus deny that it was him? No. Seriously, it's no. In this famous passage, a rich man runs up to Jesus and asks, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Before we break this down, let's look at Matthew. Matthew has the man come up and ask, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus responds by asking, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. So basically, keep the commandments. 
There's just so much to say here and I wish we could cover all of it, but before analyzing Mark, let's establish what they both say. Both passages have only one who is good. So both passages force a reader or a hearer to ask the same question, who? Or more precisely, who if not Jesus? Let's look at Matthew. When Jesus says, there's only one who is good, is it clear to you that Jesus is referring to himself here? Maybe it is, but if Jesus isn't referring to himself, then we have the same alleged problem as in Mark. Except in Mark, there's no ambiguity that Jesus is forcing the reader or hearer to address the question of who the one is directly against Jesus. For this reason, I strongly considered using this passage myself to make the opposite case for Mark coming later. As for alternative explanations, this is pretty basic but also beyond our scope. But one can't read Mark, or Matthew for that matter, consistently while interpreting this passage as Jesus somehow denying he was good and therefore God. I want to avoid theology here, but one needs to just look at Mark chapter 2 where Jesus shows he has the authority to forgive sins, something which is reserved only for God. We'll use this passage later in a different context, so I don't want to get into it here. On the only one who was good argument, I guess I would say that I wish I would have called dibs because I think this passage amplifies Jesus more in Mark than it does in Matthew. But that's neither here nor there. What matters is that this is far from compelling enough to force us to believe that Matthew came after Mark. Moving on to Jesus' difficulty healing. Is it true that Mark really has Jesus struggle to heal? No. Technically. Jesus does heal in two steps in this passage. After the first pass, the blind man regains partial vision, seeing people that look like trees. And after the second pass, the man has his full vision restored. But does this mean that Jesus struggled? Let's again ask, why is this in Mark at all? Under the presumptions that the writers of the Gospels are trying to make Jesus look as powerful as they can, why would Mark include a failed healing? The fact it's included at all suggests it has a purpose to Mark that is desirable which we may not be seeing. Thus, arguments for a later Mark including it are no less compelling than for a later Matthew excluding it. And the fact it appears only in Mark doesn't per se mean it was omitted because Luke and or Matthew didn't like the quote unquote struggle. Luke especially has omitted material from Mark which he'd be expected to include under our current assumption set. We'll discuss this later. As for alternative explanations, there are many. Some scholars argue that this is a Mark and sandwich where he uses the parable to foreshadow a message. In the verse preceding this miracle, Jesus chastises his disciples for still not knowing who he was. Then we have the parable, followed by Peter in the next verse partially recognizing Jesus as the Messiah but without understanding Jesus' ultimate mission. The sandwich wraps up with the next verses dealing with Jesus' transfiguration, showing that he was in fact God. We're not trying to solve all of that here, but it's better to have this explanation than one that reads as if this is some kind of fail or mistake, as that wouldn't be consistent with the assumptions the Mark and Priorities are asking us to rely on. So regarding Jesus' struggle to heal, we need to assume that this parable would have been bothersome enough to Matthew and Luke that they would have felt the need to exclude it, and also assume that they couldn't have excluded it on other grounds. But that's not even the real question. The real question relates to Mark's profile if he was last, and seeing as it presents a Mark and sandwich and that it was included at all, we must presume that it mattered to Mark, regardless of the order in which Mark wrote. So for this, if there's some reason why we're forced to believe that Mark couldn't have added this writing last, I have to say, I'm not seeing it. No pun intended. Having now dealt with the major arguments against the redaction profile of the later writing Mark, we should summarize what we have, and the case is not looking very good for Mark and Prioritist. For omissions, we have the birth narratives and genealogies. We discussed that Mark achieved the same objectives with a single sentence, and John excludes them as well. For the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer, we saw that Luke omits a good bit of it, and John does too. Concerning the resurrection accounts, we called foul, since not only are they foreshadowed and Jesus is risen from the dead in Mark, but the ending of that gospel is contested and it's well within the realm of possibility that the current ending wasn't the original one. As far as redactions, we looked at deeds of power and there's only one who was good. Both cases were equivocal and they may have even favored Mark writing last. And given that the alleged struggle to heal must have had significance for Mark if he was last, by virtue of its inclusion at all, we can't use this as a basis to argue against Mark's redaction profile. Folks, the prognosis here is dire, but we're not going to pronounce Mark and Priority dead just yet. Let's take a look at two lesser arguments used for Mark and Priority and see if those can pull a miracle.
pun intended. There are two additional arguments used to indicate that Mark's gospel is more primitive and thus likely earlier. These concern Mark's poorer Greek and Mark's use of Aramaisms. So we start, as always, by asking if it's true that Mark really does have poorer Greek than Matthew and Luke. The answer is yes. Just yes. The fact that Mark is written in an inferior form of Greek is a view that is widely held and generally uncontested. But I'm not in a position to evaluate the argument for myself, and so I'll concede the point for the sake of argument. That means the question now is, why would Mark, seeing the beautiful Greek of Matthew, butcher it so badly? Again, E.P. Sanders said, The entire notion of improvement or its reverse is very shaky. People who rewrote material rewrote it in their own style. If a later author liked elegance and knew how to achieve it, the product would be more elegant. But the reverse could and often did happen. Many of the apocryphal gospels of the second and subsequent centuries are written in worse Greek than Mark. Many authors, and no doubt many readers and hearers, preferred more colloquial and less elegant prose. And there are others who say that Mark's Greek reads like spoken Greek, consistent with what Professor Sanders noted. But interestingly, Mark's poor Greek has been used as an argument that Mark was earlier. Logically speaking, at least, it could just as easily indicate that the writer of Mark wasn't proficient in Greek, not because he was from the old country, but because he may have been a Roman who was more familiar with Latin. Note, I'm not arguing this one way or the other since I don't know, but other scholars over the centuries have postulated the same thing. Bottom line is, without a compelling reason to believe that later scribal works always or mostly always maintain or improve the polish of previous works, this observation just simply is not needle moving. And as for alternative explanations, I'm sure there are plenty, but that's far beyond our scope here, and I've conceded the point. And thus, concerning Mark's poor Greek, I don't have all that much to say. I guess I'll go with, take it, you can have it, but it's not going to save you. What about Mark's Aramaisms? Is it true that Mark has more Aramaisms than Matthew or Luke? Yes. Technically. But the essential question is whether or not more Aramaisms prove earlier writing. Of the seven Aramaisms found in Mark that aren't in Matthew or Luke, each one has a parenthetical translation. Would translation really have been needed if Mark's audience was an earlier Aramaic or Hebrew one? If having more Semitic flavor indicates earliness, then we'll need to explain that when we examine the very Jewish-facing Gospel of Matthew. As discussed earlier, Mark also has more Latinisms. Does that mean Mark is later? And as for alternative explanations, again, it's beyond our scope here and I've conceded the point. I'll concede that Mark has more Aramaisms, but this honestly isn't the argument some might think it is. So concerning Mark's Aramaisms, all I have to say is, I hope Mark the Priority typed up a last will and testament because all hope is lost. We could stop now and let Mark and Priority die a peaceful death. And if that's your preference, go ahead and stop here. And I thank you for making it this far. But for the savages out there who are out for blood, we can finish off Mark and Priority with a few more arguments that cut the other way. There are five we'll review here, but remember, we're not making our own case right now. Our focus with these will be less on how compelling they are in favor of Methane Priority, and they are pretty compelling, and more on how they undermine the already weak redaction profile arguments. The first argument is that there are reversible examples of redaction. The second is that there are reversible examples of omissions. Third, Mark does have additions that neither Luke or Matthew have. Fourth, given how Jewish focused the Gospel of Matthew is compared to Mark, some fancy arguments are needed to explain that. And fifth, there are some examples where it appears Mark conflated accounts of Luke and Matthew. So let's get started. If Matthew was writing after Mark, our first question is, is it true that Matthew diminishes Jesus in his account? Yes. Technically. Mark and Matthew relate an account where Jesus is set to heal a paralytic man who was brought through an opening made in the roof, desperate to see Jesus. As a sidebar, note how much more detail Mark has in his account. Anyway, Jesus sees the man and is moved and tells the man, your sins are forgiven. The teachers of the law in the room see this and they say to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Mark goes further and adds to their thoughts the question, who can forgive sins but God alone? Matthew's account does not contain this verse, meaning that if he wrote after Mark, he removed it. In later verses, both Matthew and Mark have Jesus demonstrating that he has the power to forgive sins and instructs the man to get up and walk. In Mark, the implication is pretty clear. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The answer is Jesus, 
All but the most radical skeptics concede this reading. Even Bart Ehrman begrudgingly concedes this point after many years of arguing that the synoptics don't portray Jesus as divine. He writes, In these Gospels, for example, Jesus has the power to forgive sins, and he receives worship. These can be explained without thinking of Jesus as in any way divine, but it's a little bit tricky, and at the end of the day, I think it's easier to simply say these things are said of Jesus because the authors do think of him as in some sense an exalted divine being. So it's certainly challenging to explain why Matthew would remove this if he was last. But again, this only becomes compelling if we start with the presumption that we're trying to prove, which in these hypotheticals is that Mark was first. It's a circular argument and thus isn't compelling. Likewise, this shows that the arguments on Christology and amplification are reversible and again, reversible arguments like these just aren't compelling. There are alternative explanations, Mark needed the space, the point is implied, etc. But the general point is that cherry-picked arguments like these that can be reversed and that require circular reasoning prove little, if anything at all. So as far as the reversible arguments on Christology, if I was on the other side, I'd say, you have my attention. Omissions can go both ways too. So we ask, is it true that Luke, if writing after Mark, omitted important passages from Mark? Yes. Technically. It's well known that Luke omits a great deal from Mark, roughly 75 verses in certain sections, and it's referred to as the Great Omission. There's a lesser omission as well. As with the ending of Mark, it's impossible to know if this was intentional and that's beyond the scope. But presuming it was intentional, Luke omits some seemingly important things like healings and even Jesus walking on water. In this passage, for example, from Mark, Jesus comes out to his disciples who are in the middle of the sea in a storm, walking on water. Pretty high Christology, I'd say. But again, for the same reasons as before, this is only compelling if we start with our conclusions. And it shows that, under Mark and priority theories, later writers can omit seemingly important material. Thus, the omissions arguments aren't nearly as logically compelling as they're made out to be. So yeah, later gospel writers can omit content too, so this is nothing to write home about. But as discussed earlier, under these theories, later gospel writers can also add material as well. So is it true that Mark has content that is unique to his gospel? Yes. Mark includes a number of verses not found in Luke or Matthew as shown here. Mark also has two healings which aren't in Luke or Matthew, although both involve spit. As we've seen already, Mark has longer pericope in many of the shared stories between him and Matthew and Luke. But does this tell us anything interesting? Again, no. And again, we can explain these. Perhaps these accounts were too embarrassing because they involve spit, although John's later gospel has Jesus healing with mud. Perhaps Mark is too verbose, etc. Point is, cherry-picked arguments like additions, omissions, and redactions are weak where they are reversible like these. Concerning Mark's additions, all I can say is, I don't know anymore. Before we get to the next argument, a quick aside. Also, this is a good time to ask you to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I do this as a side project and I come from a totally different professional background, but your like and sub will give me the motivation that people out there like what I'm doing. So with that out of the way, if it isn't already clear, one of the approaches I take to these debates is to let the arguments speak for themselves. Weak arguments can be exposed as weak on their own without having to resort to any caricatures of the proponents or ad hominems, etc. Of course, I will call out blatantly disingenuous arguments like the ending of Mark, but in general, I try to grant it as a given that the proponents are genuinely advancing their scholarship with legitimately held convictions. But that gets harder with arguments like the Rejudais and of Matthew. Again, I'm not going to attack the proponents of this per se, but it does force one to wonder if there's some alternate agenda here. In my line of work, arguments like Rejudaizing Matthew would be drawn and quartered by colleagues as well as rivals. But I'll end that side rant here for now just by saying that we should be going where the data leads us rather than tossing out life vests to already drowned arguments. You can judge for yourselves if that's happening here. So with that out of the way, we ask, is it true that Matthew rejudaizes a more Gentile mark? Yes. Technically. It is widely accepted across the spectrum that Matthew is the most quote-unquote Jewish of the Synoptic Gospels. I admit I don't have the experience to evaluate that claim on my own, but I've looked for dissenting opinions on this and I haven't found any.
On the contrary, here is a good summary of the aspects of Matthew that scholars agree make it the most clearly Jewish-focused, particularly first century, second temple Jewish-focused gospel. 1. Matthew makes the law, the Torah, the imperative rather than merely an ideal. 2. Matthew advocates extreme standards of righteousness with the commandments being paramount. 3. There is adherence to the law that even includes minor parts of the law, even going on to emphasize eunuchs who made themselves this way for the sake of the kingdom. And four, as discussed already, the three-chapter Sermon on the Mount, which appears to be even stronger on the law than the Torah itself. There are other issues as well, including Matthew's own use of Semitisms and the like, but we won't get into those here. So how do scholars address this, needing to cling to the fact that Matthew came later? Here's what Professor Goodacre says, quote, If this is right, then one of the things that Matthew is doing in his gospel is not just to Judaize Jesus, but to re-Judaize the Jesus of Mark's gospel, end quote. Of course, the natural question is, why would Matthew need to do this at all? And to answer that, scholars have created hypothetical Jewish breakaway communities, such as the one by Paul Foster, who says, quote, There has been a trend toward viewing the community behind the gospel as primarily a Jewish separatist group with the central belief that Jesus was the Messiah, end quote. Really? A Jewish separatist group? Again, I'm not saying it's impossible, but can we get some evidence? Furthermore, re is a circular argument, and these are common in synoptic studies. I've laid off emphasizing that too much here because this analysis focuses on accepting the arguments as they're presented, but that doesn't change the fact that circular arguments have essentially no explanatory power, and it seems that scholars confuse the observation itself, i.e. that Matthew is a very Jewish gospel, with the explanations for that observation. If the explanation requires us to presume priority in order to make sense, then it is by definition circular and it can't be used to prove the priority we've already assumed. Yes, the analysis can help us make sense of our observations, but it can't follow logically that it proves anything. This is the main problem with editorial fatigue, which I've addressed briefly but will cover in depth in another video. In short, Matthew can only be re-Judaized if we believe it was later. That's an explanation. If it was first, and for now, we're not arguing that it is, then the explanation of the observation is simply that Matthew was Judaized, not re-Judaized. Again, sorry for the rant. So this isn't compelling. And as for alternative explanations, the most basic is that Matthew was written earlier at a time when the church was still mostly Jewish, but that's beyond our scope here. With respect to the argument that Matthew re-Judaized Mark, I've got to say this is a, you have got to be kidding me. Okay, before we wrap up, there's one more argument we need to address. And that's the notion that a later Mark couldn't have conflated Matthew and Luke on technical grounds. There is a case to be made that Mark took parts of Matthew and parts of Luke, harmonized and condensed them. While this can be seen as an argument for Matthew and priority, for our purposes here, it's more of a rebuttal argument to the notion that this was technically infeasible in the first century, and thus additional evidence for Mark and priority. To start, here is a chart summarizing some examples of what are referred to as quote-unquote dualisms in Mark. These are areas where Mark seems to create a redundancy by duplicating the same concept. It's helpful to illustrate. In this first example, Mark says, the evening after sunset. This is redundant because evening is essentially the same as after sunset. Text critics argue that redundancies are common when sources conflate other sources. So look at Matthew, he just says, when the evening came, and Luke just says, at sunset. Mark seems to have smushed these together. In the next example, it's the same thing. The leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Redundant. Matthew just says he was cleansed. Luke just says the leprosy left him. You can pause the video to look at the other examples and there are several more that aren't listed here. For now, this is simply offered to address whether this kind of micro-conflation, if true, could have been done at the time of authorship. If it's not already obvious, I'll go ahead and get out of the way that this is also a circular argument even when used by Matthean prioritists. We could just as easily read these as Matthew or Luke seeing the redundancies and choosing not to deploy them. But again, that's beyond the scope here. The question we have to answer now is this. If Mark had Matthew and Luke and decided to write a gospel with the goals of resolving inconsistencies between them, de-emphasizing Jewish themes for his Gentile audience, and condensing the accounts into a shorter narrative, all plausible purposes of course, would this have been technically possible at the time? In other words, was this type of micro-conflation impossible or improbable at the time the Gospels were written? No.
Here's an excerpt from Professor Ian Mills in a YouTube podcast on the issue of market priority. This quote summarizes the market priority's position on microconflation fairly well. You can see the entire podcast link below. Quote, if Mark is using Matthew and Luke, he has to have conflated Matthew and Luke in a way that we don't see anyone else in antiquity doing, end quote. Is this assertion true? There is strong evidence to suggest that it's not. In this scholarly paper on the subject, a paper which received the 2014 Paul J. Actemeyer Award for New Testament Scholarship, James Barker rejects this argument saying that the previous work, possibly the work relied on by Professor Mills, quote, overstated the difficulty and, quote, underestimated the prevalence of microconflation in antiquity. Barker goes on to cite a number of examples. I strongly encourage anyone with interest in this topic to read the paper for themselves. But here are some key excerpts. I won't read these verbatim. You can pause the video if you like. But the first excerpt makes the crucial point that all New Testament scholars working on the synoptic problem presume some aspect of microconflation in their solutions. Additionally, ancient readers could easily dictate multiple sources to ascribe to conflate, and so we don't need to per se presume some elaborate writing setups. Third, microconflation in antiquity predates the Gospels with a number of examples. And for the argument that phrase by phrase conflation as opposed to block by block is the concern, Barker shows that Tatian's second century diatestron often does exactly this. He then gives specific examples of microconflations that are presumed by synoptic scholars. I've seen some others too, for example, in the editorial fatigue example cited by Mark and Prioritists. In summary, this argument that microconflation couldn't have been done by the author of Mark does not appear to be supported by the evidence. It's untrue. And even if it's argued to be true, it's reversible since it presents problems for the other theories as well, albeit with a lesser frequency. Barker notes, quote, every solution to the synoptic problem necessitates these scribal and redactional processes, but the two-source hypothesis does so the least, the Farrow golder hypothesis requires more, and the Griesbach hypothesis, which is that Mark was last, requires the most. Once again, more detailed analyses of this topic are beyond my expertise and beyond the scope. So as for the impossibility of microconflation in antiquity, I'd say you're running out of excuses. We observed that Mark and Priority was on life support at the outset, and we gave it a chance, but how'd it do? Sadly, the redaction profile arguments, the last resort for Mark and Priority, failed to revive it. And so, unfortunately, it's rest in peace. Before we leave, I said at the outset that there was a latent, insidious assumption in the Mark and Priority analyses. For many of you it was obvious, but just in case, it's that the Gospel writers just willy-nilly made things up. Put another way, it's that the traditions of authorship and intent attributed to the Gospels couldn't have been true. Now I'm not arguing this one way or the other, but the insidious nature of this assumption is that these can't be historical biographical accounts, but rather reflect purposeful development of folklore or mythology. There are a number of problems with this assumption, from theological to academic, but I'll end with this. If this is what scholars perceive going in, then it's no wonder we're getting the output we're getting. This kind of bias on a scientific scholarly inquiry is not just likely, but guaranteed to yield flawed results. Alright, next up we'll address editorial fatigue and the patristic testimony, though I'm not sure in which order yet. If you stayed this far and like this kind of work, please drop a like and comment and subscribe. Thanks.